We would like to welcome you to Calvary Church's online service. We are the Spolstras, Bethany, Stephen, Abigail, and Frederick. Thank you for joining us for the service today. Whether it's your first time or if you've been joining us for a while, it's great to have you with us. If this is your first time joining us, please go to the main page of, of Calvary's website. If you scroll down, you will see a connection card. Please take the time to fill it out so that we can get to know you. In today's service, Pastor Josh will be kicking off a brand new sermon series called I Am. This series will look at the I Am statements from the Gospel of John. Today, Josh will be taking a look at the statement, I am the light of the world. Please pray with us. Lord God, we thank you so much for this time together this morning to come together to worship you. I just pray you'd be with us wherever we are this morning. Um, taking in your word, Lord, just be with Pastor Josh as he preaches the, the, preaches the word today, Lord. I just pray that um, you would reveal yourself to us today, Lord, and uh, just be with everybody in the church family and just, uh, just, just bless our time together. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. This morning's call to worship is found in Psalm 96, verses 1 to 9, and I'll be reading from the ESV version. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. This passage tells us that we are to sing praises to our Lord and Savior, to declare his glory, majesty, strength, splendor, and marvelous works to all those around us. God's salvation has delivered us from death, and he deserves all of our praise and worship. The first song that we'll be singing together this morning is called You Cannot Be Stopped. And in this song, we can declare some of these truths. That our mighty and strong God can move mountains, he can break chains, he has triumphed over the grave, and he has won the battle. Nothing can stand against our God. Before we continue our time of singing this morning, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with praise and worship for who you are, the one true God who is worthy of all of our praise. We declare that you have done wondrous works and that you are full of glory and strength. Thank you for being our salvation and for winning the battle over death, for us to have eternal life if we accept and believe in you. We thank you for this time we have to worship you together now, and we pray that lives would be changed through your word that we will hear today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The dark tried to hide you and seal you away. Death tried to keep Inside of the grave The enemy fought you He tried but he lost You cannot be stopped When we cried for freedom You tore down the Say 
Each week, we take time in our service to pause and to pray. Uh, And so this week, uh, our prayer time is going to actually be a prayer of confession time, uh, to spend some personal time with God, uh, just confessing to him uh, sins that might come to mind. Uh, Psalm 51, uh, David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Uh, The beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why don't you take a moment uh, just to pause the video and again, take some personal time, uh, just confessing to the Lord. Uh, Again, things that come to mind that go against his will for your life. uh, And then just enjoy the forgiveness that Jesus has. And once you're done that, uh, we just ask you to resume the video. Our scripture reading for today comes from John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20, and I'll be reading from the ESV version. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true for I know where I come from or where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. This is the word of the Lord. Hi, and thanks for joining us at Calvary Online. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and we're really excited to kick off a new series. We just finished our emotive series, and then we had uh, a look at counting the cost of following Jesus. And today we're launching into a new series that we've called I Am. And we want to look at some of the unique claims that Jesus made. A while ago at a staff meeting, I was talking about this upcoming series and how I just really wanted to talk about Jesus. And Aaron had the idea, Aaron had the idea that we should do the I am statements of Jesus. And so we're going to work through those. Uh, We're going to work through those going through Lent because Lent started this week. And we're going to work our way right up to the resurrection and the life on Easter Sunday. And we're going to look at some of the claims that Jesus made about himself. And years ago, in 1942, and later published in 1952, uh, in in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis gave the argument about Jesus and some of the claims that he made about himself. And he says this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. People will often say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he is neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is the Son of God. C.S. Lewis is, of course, talking about some of the claims that Jesus made about himself and some of the very claims that we will be examining as we go through this series. And today we want to take a look at the thought of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And there's a real tension there. There's a real tension there because often when we think of light, like what comes to mind? When we think of light, what do we naturally think of? We think of light fixtures in our house, you know, and this isn't in my house, so it's nice, I wish it was. Or we think of street lights that provide illumination while we're driving or stop lights that give us instruction. When I was thinking about lights and light bulbs going off, I actually had an idea 
the light bulb going off and how oftentimes we think of uh, illumination and how a, a good idea, a bright idea. If you're more scientifically minded, you might know and understand uh, what Einstein was saying that light is both a particle and a wave. I do not. I never did any physics in high school. I managed to dodge that one. Some people are really good at it and I'm just determined to let them do it because I don't have to. But light is both a particle and a wave. And, and so when we think about light, we think in terms of our North American context, right? And so we might think Jesus says he's the light of the world. Or, well, that's a really bright idea. It might be a good idea to follow Jesus. Or he provides illumination, right? But really, when we, ask, when we get right down to it, uh, we have to ask, what did Jesus mean when he called himself the light of the world in verse 12? Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, right? And so if we're actually gonna process this and, and start to think through, we have to understand what Jesus meant and what the people hearing that statement would understand when he said that he was the light of the world. Now, it's also important to recognize that he calls himself the light of the world, but he wasn't the only one. He was recognized by others as the light, in Luke chapter 2, verse 29 to 32, we have the story of Simeon. It says that Simeon was a righteous man and he was waiting for the reconciliation of Israel. And so Mary and Joseph, they bring in Jesus uh, to bring him in to be circumcised as was the, the custom. They had to bring him in. So they bring him in to be circumcised and Simeon takes him up in his arms and blessed God and says in verse 29, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And so he's actually already recognized by the light when he's an infant. He's recognized as the light. So when he says that I am the light of the world, he actually has people who have already said that. But what he is doing is he's continuing to push the boundaries. We started at verse 12. If you back up and read John chapter 8, 1 to 11, you'll see that Jesus is in the temple and he's confronting the Pharisees and they've brought a woman who was caught in adultery and they've kind of thrown her on the ground in front of him and they're trying to test him. And they say this, you know, the law says that this woman is to be stoned. What do you say? Because if he says stone her, then he's not being merciful. If he says let her go, then he's not doing justice. And instead, he challenges them that whichever one of you have not sinned, you may throw that first stone. So they go away and they don't end up condemning her and neither does Jesus. And then he continues to talk and that's where he tells them, he continues to speak to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. So he's going to push the boundaries because what he is doing here really in essence is he is claiming to be God. And the Pharisees who are hearing this, to them, to them, this is blasphemy. To them, they are so offended. They are waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for the long prophesied for Messiah for generations. But they're pretty sure Jesus isn't it. And so when he says that he is the light of the world, the filter that they will hear through, the glasses that they will see that through is very different. He's claiming to be God and he compares himself to God. Genesis chapter one, verse three, God said in the beginning, let there be light. You know, Genesis chapter one in, the, one, in the beginning was the heavens and the earth. Verse three, and God said, let there be light and there was. And so God created light. And so Jesus saying that I am the light of the world, he's saying he's part of God's creation. And in fact, he was there at creation. And so these Pharisees will be hearing that through a lens where he is actually comparing himself to God. And he takes the analogy of light and, and the different ways that these Pharisees would hear it as they go through and as Jesus is talking, they would know and understand when he says that he is the light of the world, that light gives life. Psalm 56 verse 13 says, for you have delivered my soul from death, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of of life. And so he is actually, he is the one who brings life. God created, you know, we have the creation story. We have God's creation and we have, uh, we have the way that he brought forth life. And now light gives life. You have kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of life. It's God's rule to give life that we may walk in the light of life. 
And so when Jesus says that I am the light of the world, he's saying that he is the one who gives life. And we'll focus in a little bit more as we work through some of the other ways they would understand that. But that light gives life. And so the Pharisees aren't going to like that because, that, again, that's part of the filter they're listening with. The next thing that they're going to understand is that light brings forth justice. Psalm 37, 6. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So it is God, it is God who, whose light brings righteousness and who brings forth justice as bright as the noonday, who brings light. That is God's role. The Pharisees who were hearing this thought it was their job to help God. And so it created all these other rules with which we could develop. They, they had their own set of righteousness that they were trying to get of their own effort. They were trying to earn their own right to do all the things themselves and, and the acts and the things that the lists and lists and lists of rules they created so that they could be declared righteous, right? But light brings forth righteousness and justice, that's God's job. And that's also the Messiah's job, right? That, that Messiah, the one that they are waiting for, will judge the living and the dead, will, will be with the people of Israel and bring about, bring about justice for the people of Israel, will bring about spiritual justice for everybody. See, the Pharisees were waiting for a Messiah to bring political justice and national justice. They weren't so much worried about the other side of it. But here we have them, here, they have, here we have the Pharisees listening to Jesus saying that he is the light of the world and so that he's going to do part of what they think the Messiah should do. And so again, they're not going to like it. And that light overcomes darkness. Not only does it bring justice, but it overcomes darkness. Psalm 139, 11 and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. Light will overcome the darkness. So Jesus saying that he is the light of the world, he's saying that he will overcome the darkness. And we know and we understand that as followers of Jesus, we believe that through the power of his death and his resurrection, that he broke the power of death and darkness once and for all. That he defeated the grave that he defeated the powers of hell in what he did in his sacrifice for us on the cross. But to the Pharisees who are hearing this, him saying that light overcomes the darkness, he's called himself the light of the world, he is going to do God's job. So he's claiming to be God, he's claiming to be Messiah, and the Pharisees, again, will not like that. And we also see how light provides direction. Jesus is saying, I am the way, I am the light of the world, and so light provided for direction. In Exodus 13, 21 to 22, that of course is the story of God leading the people of Israel. And again, part of the lens that the Pharisees would see this through was that as they were, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. And so we see how light provides direction and how God clearly led his people. If you read the whole chapter of Exodus 13, it talks about how God led them by, you know, by a different route so that they didn't become uh, disenchanted. They didn't become brokenhearted and want to go back and, and how he provided for them and he guided them and how he directed their steps. And so Jesus claiming to be, excuse me, the light, is claiming to be God because he is saying that he will provide direction. And ultimately, ultimately, light is very closely in the writings of Paul tied with the idea of salvation. Now, Paul hadn't been writing yet because Paul uh, was still not, uh, he was still a Pharisee himself at the time that Jesus is saying this. But in his writings later on, he's going to flush out the whole idea of light. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so light, 
the Pharisees hearing this, the ones hearing this, would know and they would understand that lights actually uh, is pointing towards salvation. Because a lot of Paul's writings are based out of his understanding as a Hebrew scholar. And so we see, you know, light bringing salvation. And so Jesus saying, by saying, I am the light of the world, he is saying he is the one who is bringing salvation. And even Hellenistic, even Greeks who are hearing this or who are reading this afterwards, they would understand that he is claiming not only to be uh, God, but to be a very good God because always in Greek literature, uh, those, the, the Roman literature, the, the people around them, uh, the, the gods of light were the good gods. And so by Jesus claiming to be the light of the world, he is saying that he is not only the one who gives light, but he is the, not only has he got illumination, he is the one who gives illumination, right? A lot of people claim to have truth and to have knowledge. Jesus is going beyond that. He's saying he is the one that the truth and the knowledge come from. And so this is a big deal. So he presents these arguments and the Pharisees, of course, they go back to the legal arguments against Jesus. And they say simply this, uh, so the Pharisee said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true because you needed to have at least two witnesses. In a court case, you needed to have at least two witnesses who would testify to something. Jesus only has himself, but he's actually had this debate with them back in John chapter five. And he talks about how the father testifies for him, how the prophets testify, the word of God testifies for him, how he has more than just himself who is testifying about himself. But again, the Pharisees, just like when they brought the woman in a few verses before and are trying to trip him up, they're trying to do all they can to trip him up so that the light cannot shine. They want to keep him from doing what he has been called to do because it's going to upset their apple cart. You know, they've got a good working relationship with, with Herod and, you know, they've got a good working relationship with Pontius Pilate and they've got authority and they've got clout and they've got their temple the way they want it. It's being improved all the time. And they have not only religious authority because they're being appointed to do these things, but you know, they also have some political authority because they have close friends who are their buddy buddy with, right? And, and so there's this real tension. And, and so they're doing all they can to trip up Jesus. And he is actually by saying, I am the light of the world. He's entering into a pretty serious debate with them, which they will continue to use. And basically, uh, Jesus isn't doing himself any favors because he tells the Pharisees that they are unaware of what God is doing. No, he says this in verse 14. Jesus answered, if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. See, these are, these are the Pharisees. These are the people who are supposed to know about God. And they're supposed to be able to tell people all about God. And they're supposed to understand what God is doing. But they don't really know him. They know all about him. And there's a real danger in that. There's a lot of people who know all about God. There's a lot of people who know all about Jesus, but they don't really know him. They've not submitted their lives to him and chosen to follow him. They might know this, really well. They might know their Bible really well, but are they living it out practically and doing the things that Christ calls us to? And there's a lot of people who are going to come and say, Lord, didn't we do all these incredible miracles? Didn't we cast out demons and do all these things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's what he's saying to the Pharisees right here. Like you guys are the leaders of the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. You're supposed to be the religious leaders who point us towards God and you don't know me and you don't recognize me, and you don't realize that I have come from the Father, and that I'm going back to the Father, and that I've come to fulfill the purpose that he has called me to, to bring light to the world, that I've come to fulfill the role of Savior. He has this whole argument with him about judgment, and he says this. He says simply, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. You know, we often quote one of the most well-known verses in the Bible, and that's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. But don't miss verse 17. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus has come to fulfill the role of savior. God has raised the standard. Jesus pays that price. We accept what Jesus has done for us or we bring a judgment upon ourselves. Jesus did not come to judge anyone. He came to enforce and to live out what God had called to provide a way for us to escape the judgment, for us to experience the grace that God offers us through Jesus. And that's what these these rabbis, these, these Pharisees have missed. And it's not about grace for them. It's not about, it's not about being a part of what God is doing. They've missed that. And so they don't even recognize that Jesus has come to be the savior, that he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets, that which they've been waiting for. And then Jesus goes back really quickly and he lets them know that I do actually meet the requirements of your law. In your law it is written, the testimony of two people is true. I'm the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, therefore, where's your father? And he answered, you know neither me nor the father. And if you knew me, you would know the father also. So he goes back really quickly to their argument and says, yeah, I'm actually, I'm here. And the testimony that God gives through me, you know, look at the things that I am doing. The father gives testimony because he allows me to raise the dead, to do some of the miracles, to feed the 5,000, you know, to, to heal the sick to cause the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear, to set people free from the demonic oppression that has held some of them for years, right? To set them free, to see them experiencing the richness and the fullness of what God has in their life. God is testifying on my behalf by allowing me to do these things. But, so I meet your requirements of your law, but you are still walking in darkness because if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Father. And if you don't know the Father, then you don't know Jesus. And so Jesus has come to bring the light. He's come to bring hope, to be the light of the world and and to be the Savior and to vanquish darkness and to do all the things that we have talked about. And the Pharisees are still walking in darkness. Where are you walking today? You know, are you walking in that darkness are you looking for, what, uh, for, for the light to break through and for the light to shine? Because that light shines the same for everybody. And we are all offered that same extension of that love and that grace through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And he comes in, and this comes for him at a heavy price because his words were taking him to the cross eventually. The words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. But when he's saying these things, he's, he's actually embittering, uh, making the Pharisees embittered towards him. You know, he's actually putting a target on his back, you know, and, and, and giving them fodder for when they finally will bring up trumped up charges and, and have a kangaroo court. But he knows that there's a plan that he must work out that plan for him to actually be the light of the world to shine in our lives. That light shone 2,000 years ago and it still shines today. And there is a challenge that he offers us, you know, that we are actually to be light as well, that we are to walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with the need to walk, first of all, with him and to understand what he has done for us. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is proclaiming that he is God and that he is with us, that he is to guide us, to direct us, that he's the one who's the author and perfecter of our salvation. And have you accepted that? Maybe this is the first time you've tuned into a church service. Maybe you've never even darkened to the door of a church building. You're afraid it'll fall in on you. Well, guess what? I'm in a church right now and it hasn't fallen in on me. So we're probably in the same boat. So we're okay. Maybe for the first time you're hearing about how Jesus is the light of the world and how he came to offer himself for us. And you're sitting there going, yes, I need that light to shine in my life. I need to follow after this Jesus. How do I get that light? Well, let me tell you, it's this pretty simple thing. It's first of all, admit, ABC, admit that you have walked apart from God and that you've done things that have offended him and that you are sorry for those. Then you must believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he has come come to, to restore and to make all things new. 
And then just confess, confess that, Father, yeah, those things that have kept me from you, I lay, I lay them down and I ask you to take them up. And I ask you to lead me the way you led the people of Israel. I want to follow you. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ who passionately pursues growing, building your kingdom, sharing your faith with others, sharing your love with others, and loving you others as I love you and as loving God and loving myself. So if that's you, I would love to hear from you. If you've, just, uh, if you've, if you've come to that point where you, you want to kind of move forward in faith and you want to identify with the church and be a follower of Jesus and, and walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship here and be a part of what we're doing, we'd love to hear from you. It's josh at calvaryguelph.com. Just send me an email and I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to hear your story. And maybe, maybe for those who are, who are hearing this who might have heard about it before, we've never really understood the context of what Jesus was actually saying. We have a deeper responsibility now to walk knowing that he is the light and what that calls us to do and how we are to move ahead in our faith. To be faithful to what he is calling us, to be faithful to the mission that God has called us to be on with Jesus. So as we're moving ahead, uh, we have the opportunity to be light to, in someone else's life and to share in someone else's life the life and the hope that we have in Jesus. So if that's you, I ask you just, what are you going to do this week? What can you do so that you can shine the light in someone's life, shine the light of Jesus in someone's life? Can you shovel snow for your neighbor? Can you drop off some cookies? Can you, can you go and you, can you help them push their car out of a snowbank? I saw that this week a few times, right? Just opportunities for us to go and to be light and life, and to bring hope, and to bring Jesus to those around us. Father, right now, I want to thank you that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. I want to thank you that he has, uh, he has come to bring light into darkness. And it is a dark place. There are darkness, there's darkness that exists in this world. And so we just want to actually stop, and we want to uh, see what it is that you have for us and how you are calling us to be light, to walk in the light. And we want to thank you for the gift of salvation that you have given us. As we go through Lent, as we study the I Am statements moving up towards the resurrection and the life, we are so grateful for the way that you are the one who guides our steps and who will never leave us nor forsake us. So Father, be with us now. Uh, make us truly mindful of the opportunities you give us to be light in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you folks, we'll see you next week. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy Messiah still and all alone. Don't praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing.
blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Thank you for joining us for our service. Just as we wrap up, we want to present some opportunities for ministry and ways that we can respond uh, as we hear the word of Christ saying that I am the light of the world. And one of the things that we do understand is that the light of the world shines for kids. And our Calvary Kids video, if you go to our website, you can go to our children's ministry, click watch, and you can see a wonderful video uh, for our children to help them as they grow and develop and walk in their faith. And you don't want to miss that. I watched the one from last week when we talked about counting the cost of following Jesus. And it was just wonderful to hear the teaching that Christina shared and to see the different families who were part of that. So you'll make sure if you didn't see that one last week, you can watch too, because they're both great. And it's just a wonderful thing that we have that opportunity for our kids. Uh, as well for our families, we have a family discipleship book and we've been delivering those. Some of the staff and the elders have been bringing those to your houses. If you have kids under the age of 18 and you haven't got a book and you would like one, please contact, uh, contact us at the church. You can email brenda at calvaryguelph.com and uh, we will make sure that you get a copy of that book because uh, as, as you read that book in a few months, uh, in a few weeks starting in March, we're actually going to be having a virtual small group where we can get together to discuss that book with different ways and things that we can talk about in raising children in a family of faith. Uh, you can also email Aaron or Christina, Aaron at CalvaryGuelph.com, Christina at CalvaryGuelph.com so that you can get your hands on a copy of that book. Uh, in terms of our church life, we have, the way that we are structured is we have a nominating committee and we are looking for people to take part in being on that committee. You meet a couple times a year and you, know, you find people to serve in different roles in the church that is brought to the congregation for a vote. We need a few people to be members of that committee to help us as we continue to seek out people to serve and to grow and to help build the kingdom here. So if you're interested in being a part of that or if you'd like to nominate somebody to be on the nominating committee, please reach out to us at info at calvaryguelph.com and we'll put you in touch with the chair of the nominating committee and we can get it going from there. And if you are web savvy and you're on our webpage right now, you can go to the bottom of the webpage on the front page, the homepage, and it says directory. And you click on that and that will take you to our church directory online. Your information will not be published there unless you choose to. And you can give as much or as little as you want. You can just give your name. You don't have to give anything else. Some people give name, address, phone number, email. That's completely up to you. And that is for our church members by invitation. And so if you'd like to take a look at that, uh, we will be sending out an email with a bit more information in the coming weeks just so you can explore that as we look to have that directory for our church family online. Uh, next week, uh, continuing the I Am series, we're looking at I Am the Door for the Sheep, where Jesus calls himself the door for the sheep, the gateway to holiness, the gateway to God. And so we'll be taking a look at that. So we'll hope you'll join us next week for I Am the Door to the Sheep. And then if you can join us, uh, every, every service that we end, we end with ascending scripture. And we like to change that scripture for every different series. And so for this series, the I Am series, talking about Jesus, we're just going to read from John chapter one, one to five, 
every week right up till Easter. And hopefully this helps us to memorize it as well so that we get the word of God in our hearts and in our minds. So if you can read with me, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. May you go this week walking in the light of Jesus Christ, taking the light of the world to the world around you. Blessings and peace. See you next week.